Hi there, I'm Felix Clock, and I'm a member of the Rust compiler team and I want to take some time to tell you about how you can help uh, get, you can get started helping contribute to Rust yourself and the first step towards learning to contribute to Rust is to learn how to actually build the product to build the Rust compiler and standard library that are the basis of Rust itself. Now if you haven't heard of Rust you can learn a lot more about it at our website www.rustlang.org this is not a video about Rust, so you'd have to you know, go read the website about how Rust is a language that is meant to provide all kinds of superpowers in terms of providing low-level control over your system, while also informing a, enforcing a number of safety guarantees, such as memory safety and data race freedom, which enables all kinds of amazing development strategies involving parallelism and um, just passing memory around and, and you know, lots, of, lots of cool stuff in terms of giving you a lot of efficiency, but also a lot of high level control over your program and understanding what it does. But I'm not here to try to sell you on Rust. I'm here to try to sell you on contributing to Rust. And the step for doing that is you can find the Rust source code at on GitHub at github.com forward slash Rust slang forward slash Rust. And here you'll find the code for Rust. And the other place to look for contributing to Rust, if you look at the readme file, one of the very first things it says is that this readme is not for contributors, it's for users. And if you want to learn to contribute to the compiler, you should look at the getting started section of the Rust-C dev guide. And that brings me to the third site that I want to, you know, just mention, which is the Rust-C dev guide, which has a table of contents that has a whole bunch of stuff about contributing to Rust and getting involved. And the part we'll be focusing on today is how to build and run the compiler. Now, to be clear, the Rusty Dev Guide actually includes a lot more information, for example, about the kinds of system requirements you'll need, such as the hardware that you'll need, um, and you know, you'll want as, basically as powerful machine as you can get your hands on, um, and the uh, other pieces of software that you need, such as um, uh, these various dependencies on Python and curl and Git and so on. I'm going to pretend like you've already had all those things installed because on Linux, you probably do. So let's just go ahead and look into the actual process of building Rust. So um, this, this, this page does spell out the steps you could follow to do it. I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach and just show you how you might get started if you're sort of blindly working without going through this page step by step and then talk about you know, where that might lead you astray. So in particular, the very first thing we need to do is we need to clone the repository. And so I'm gonna go into a directory over here screencast okay good and I'm going to take the URL I could take this URL here um, but I'm actually going to grab a slightly different one the SSH based one so if you use if you're not familiar with github there's a number of different URLs you can use this one is HTTPS based so it basically gives you a checkout that you won't be able to use you won't be able to use this to push back to another repository versus an SSH one where you can take this and push back to other repositories for example if you forked the repository you could push back to your own fork so let's go ahead and use this and I'm going to call this rust src for source up oh, and here's our first problem um, I don't have a public key to like clone that repository so this is an example of the kind of thing that can happen if you're you know just working blindly and in fact that's probably why this page uses the HTTPS uh, connection instead of this other one um, instead of using SSH but the way you can resolve this is to add, you have a public key, public key, private key pair. Um, uh, you can uh, follow these commands to make an SSH agent and register it. And now you've got your key added and hopefully this will be enough for me to clone. There we go, now I can start cloning this thing. Oh, actually, I wanna get into the habit of doing one other thing while we're doing this, is to time these commands. You get an idea of how long it takes to do it. Um, this is a network bound operation for the most part, although I guess if you had a really slow hard disk, maybe it'd be IO bound for your local um, disk drive. But the point is, it's definitely input output bound. So we get to sit here and talk for a little bit while this runs in the background. So we've got this page that describes uh, the, system, the requirements for building and we're gonna be focusing on how to build and run the compiler. And the other thing is that is there another thing? No, I think this is enough. The, net, the other thing I will point out is that there is a script that we'll be using as we go through these steps, and it is called the uh, x.py or just x script. So if we go into the source directory here, 
you'll see that there's uh, 16 files off the bat right here in this directory. And if I do a, uh, a du.sh on the source tree, we'll see that this is 1.3 gigabytes when it's, initially, when it's initially checked out. But uh, there's a gotcha there, which we'll see in a second, I believe. So let me go ahead and get started with getting this thing built. So as I mentioned, there's this x.py script. And as it turns out, there's a couple other scripts just sitting there. But what they are is basically just wrappers around x.py. So there's this x script. And what it does is it just figures out um, what version of Python it needs to run. And this is, an, uh, this is a shell script, bin sh script. So it figures out what Python to run, and then figures out where xpy is, and then figures out, figures out how to invoke it. So this is all a bunch of stuff just to make it easier to um, invoke this script. And likewise, I think this is a PowerShell script over here that does the same thing. Um, it's just that's for PowerShell instead of, instead of bash or sh. Having said all that, what we can do is we can just go and go into a, um, well, the very first thing I want to say after all that is that you can just, you could just build right inside of here. You could just run um, dot forward slash X and then forward slash build and let things go. That is an option for you at this point. And it would do something. It would do stuff. It would, be, it would do useful stuff even. Um, but I want to do some demonstrations of um, what actually happens and to keep the object code distinct from the source code. So having said all that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a separate directory. I'm going to call it rush, rust obj1. And I'm going to go in there. And then I'm going to run the build script x. I could just run x.py directly, or I could run x. It doesn't really matter from this, from this point of view. Um, I'll run X since it seems like that might be what more people need to do. And I'm going to run, just run X build off the bat right here. Okay. I'm going to time it. So explain what this is doing. This is downloading a beta copy of Rust itself. Rust, Rust compiler and standard library are implemented in Rust. And so you actually need a copy of Rust to build Rust. And that's what this did. It first grabbed a copy of Rust to build tools. Now what tool is it building first? It's building the Rust build tool. We have our own build tool analogous to make and whatnot that um, handles the actual act of coordinating the build process of Rust. So we first have to download Rust to build the Rust build tool and then build that tool. And then we build it, it sends out, it sends, starts spitting out output. Namely, it's sending out output about how you didn't run XPY setup. You have not made a config.toml file, but it's going to keep going and trying to you know, do useful work on our behalf. It checks out some Git submodules. Um, and I note that because it's checking those out into our source tree. We'll see that in a second. So it's got a bunch of outputs that's producing as it downloads its Git submodules. Um, then it downloads some more reference tools like the Rust format reference tool. It does some more extraction of, of some various things. And now it's um, checking out the LVM project. Rust has LVM as a compiler backend. So Rust handles translating Rust source code into uh, executable binary code or shared objects. But a lot of that work is actually handled by a third party component called LLVM, where you feed, where you build up structure called LLVM bit code and hand it off to LLVM. And it handles the very last mile of turning that bit code into target specific machine code. OK, it downloaded LLVM as a source product and checked out a certain copy of the LLVM project. And now it is building Rust crates. All this green stuff on the side here are various Rust crates that are being built Again, all in the on service of bootstrapping the compiler itself. Now we're seeing a bunch of output where this is um, actually the output that's produced from the attempt to build LLVM itself. So this is the configure script that got driven by x.py, and it's running all these builds of LLVM. You can see there's 3,000 source files that's building, and it's going pretty fast. It's a pretty beefy machine I have sitting here, so it's able to build these files pretty darn quickly. Um, but still, we have to sit here and wait while it does it, which we will do. So the point is, this is all running right now. And with the goal of building a copy of LLVM that we will then link into, it's a native piece of native, native code that we will link into the Rust compiler so that it can handle generating native code. When I say link into the Rust compiler, I mean the Rust compiler that we build. So there's a distinction here between the one we downloaded, the bootstrap Rust code that we downloaded, and it's being used to drive a lot of this versus the copy of Rust that we're gonna build ourselves and then link into this copy of LLVM that we are building ourselves right now. 
so that's that's going along and progressing on its own. Uh, and beyond that, uh, this is obviously taking a while. So this is this is perhaps one of the most expensive steps when it comes to building Rust, at least the off-the-shelf build that we're doing right here, uh, because it just LLVM is an expensive piece expensive piece of the tool chain to build up. And you might be sitting here and wondering right now, wow, I wanted to get involved with building with, with contributing to Rust, and you're telling me that I have to start worrying about the LLVM source code. I have to download that source code and worry about it being built. Am I gonna have to start hacking on LLVM itself to contribute to Rust? And I'm here to assure you, no. In, in no way are we expecting our contributors to hack on LLVM. Or in fact, we're not even expecting you to have to build LLVM. One of the very important steps towards speeding up the build process that we'll get into in a second is how to teaching is telling you how to sidestep this very expensive step of building LLVM. I'm just pointing out to you the default you experience you get off the shelf if you try to do a build of Rust without um, making any changes to a configuration file to fine tune choices like this. Basically, this experience is the one that we started with in terms of when this project was first made, and we've inherited a lot of the choices that were made from there. There, in terms of you know building our own fork of LLVM, because we make our own little patches to LLVM, uh, in addition to uh, you know the, the off-the-shelf stuff that we, we we have here. So now we've got um, a build of LLVM that is almost finished. It's on you know file three thousand eight now, three thousand twenty-seven. So we've got. Just a few more that we're waiting through, and now some of those files are getting installed, and some more builds are happening. Okay, and this will all be done quite soon, and then we'll pa I'll pause at that point because I can hear some people coming in from outside. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that um, this is going pretty fast. That's because this machine, this machine is pretty beefy, and you'll see in a second with the time output what I mean by that, because you might expect um, this to run. You, you don't necessarily want, you shouldn't necessarily expect this to run this fast on your own machine at home. We do, we are in the process of um, providing access to some cloud desktops that are pretty beefy and might, and will probably offer something similar to what this machine that I'm building on offers. Uh, but I'm just trying to set expectations accordingly here in terms of how fast you might expect the build to, to, to be turned around and this is a build from scratch that i've been producing here and i've been waiting been waiting quite a while for it you know this is this is this is a turnaround time that you don't want to have to wait on every single build so now we're waiting for the rust driver to build and another thing i should point out here we we built the standard library for rust we built the compiler for rust and it's going to go and build the standard library again using the compiler that it just built so we're not quite done yet, but we're very close. So we're just going to wait a little while longer for that to finish. And once, it done, once it's done, then we can start talking about ways to uh, change this build process to make it go a bit faster, because you don't want to wait this many minutes on every single build that you do in the future, I assume. Um, so let's let's just wait and see what's it doing now. Now it's building RustDoc, I believe. RustDoc is our documentation tool that could take in Rust source code and generate HTML-style documentation um, that extracts from the comments of the Rust file, the Rust source code that has of those uh, so-called crates that we have that are each uh, software package. Okay, it finished. I want you to point out something to you here. I, I tried to emphasize this several times. This was about seven minutes of time that we've been sitting here watching this run, but the user time and system time were actually on the order of 300 minutes. So yeah, this is gonna take a while on a machine that isn't heavily, doesn't have a lot of parallelism. Um, so that's the first thing I wanna point out. The second thing I wanna point out is earlier we saw a du.sh of um, the source tree, but we actually downloaded some stuff so now it was like one point. So it was one point something gigs before. Now it's two point nine gigs. So that's the second thing I want to point out. We built Rust itself in this Rust obj one directory, and the act of building Rust um, that first time around actually added some extra source stuff to the Rust SRC directory, which we can see by because it grew from one point three gigabytes to two point nine gigabytes. And if we do an ls inside of Rust source. We'll see that 
there's still 16 things in here. So the stuff that got checked out are things like Git submodules. So you can read about Git submodules yourself, uh, but the, the, the high level point is that there's a whole bunch of submodules that get checked out to play, into places like source docs, source tools, source LLVM project, um, and library backtrace. So there's a whole bunch of um, other repositories that get checked out in that first initial build. And so the repository size will grow from 1.3 1, 1 to 1 point to, to whatever it was, 2.9 um, 2 2 gigabytes. So yeah, you need a fair amount of space. Uh, but we now have a copy of Rust in this Rust obj1 directory, and we could we can run this. We can actually uh, create a hello world file written in Rust, right? And then we can run the compiler. Uh, the compiler is going to be located inside this build subtree. The reason it ends up in a subtree of where we are is because we assume by default people are probably going to be working from within the source directory, and so by default we assume that they're going to run, they're going to have their um, do their builds in there, and thus we put all the build products into a subdirectory so that they don't, um, you know, confuse things with the source tree material. So if we go, if we look inside the build directory, we see that there's a couple different directories inside of here. Uh, there's the Bootstrap directory, which is where it's built the binaries for the um, Bootstrap program. Uh, bootstrap program that handles uh, bootstrapping Rust itself. There's also um, a cache directory, which is where we keep the copies of the things we downloaded, um, the tar files that we downloaded as part of the initial bootstrapping process. And then finally we have, well, we, and then we have a few more things. We've got a temp directory, it doesn't have any in it yet. And we have the actual builds for Rust itself. And so this is the place where you want to look to find the builds uh, that we would run. So the stages correspond to copies of Rust that uh, you can that are used to then build subsequent stages. So the stage zero build is used to build the stage one uh, products. So for example, if we were to run Rust C version on this, um, the stage zero build. This is a beta one version that was built on September 19th uh, because, or rather it's from a commit from September 19th, because this is not the build that we, uh, right. Uh, this is not the build that we just built ourselves to be very clear, this stage zero one, because our Git, our Git log is actually from November 3rd uh, for both the head of the repository is at. So my point, the point I'm making is that this stage zero thing corresponds to the Rust that we downloaded and unpacked and ran to build other stuff. So if you want to know about the Rust that we built just, and we could still run this to be clear, we can run this and build hello world and we get something, but that's not, but that's not the Rust that we, the point is we're not using the Rust compiler that we just built when we built that hello world. We're using the bootstrap one that we downloaded. So, um, if you want to demonstrate using the Rust compiler that we built, you have to use the stage one directory. Now, I, I spell all this out just to make it very clear about how you can find the binaries that are built if you're like troubleshooting things. Um, so here we've now built the hello world with the Rust compiler that we just built. But it's also important to note that uh, we uh, don't expect people necessarily to have to, to you know, uh, use build paths that go into this directory. In fact, the process of doing x.py setup will automatically link to this stage one tool um, by using RustUp. RustUp is a tool for managing multiple copies of Rust on a system. And so if you uh, download RustUp, which you can find, I think at rustup.rs, you can install this yourself if you haven't already. Um, and that will let you have um, copies of Rust installed. In particular, um, the se x.py setup will install a, st a stage one um, a tool chain that will be a link into the one that we just built in this directory. Uh, so let's let's talk about this. So I already mentioned how this bootstrap took a long time, and I want to 
review right. I want to describe right now some ways that we can improve upon that process. So the very first thing I'll mention is that uh, I'm going to do my work in a different directory. We have our directory. We, we just have a build that we put in right here, which has in particular an LVM build inside of here that it's built. Uh, but we, uh, that was when we built ourselves. It took a long time to build. So what I want to do now is create a different object directory, which I'll call, I'll call it Opt 2 I'm going to go in here and demonstrate something. So first of all, if you look at the instructions for how to build the compiler, it describes creating a config.toml file. And the way that they recommend doing it in this um, series of instructions is to do it by running XPY setup. So we can do it over here. I know from experience that I was surprised by this, and I might this might change in the future, but if you run X setup um, in a different directory from the source directory, because most people do their work in a source checkout, and so things are often optimized around assuming you're in a source checkout. So if we run X setup, why don't I just point out there's nothing there's nothing in here right now. And if we do XPY setup in here, then it's gonna again. So we're we're in a fresh object directory now, right? We're one that didn't have anything. So it's it's once again downloading a copy of Rust to use to build the uh, the bootstrapping material uh, in terms of the 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 the, the uh, Rust build the Rust build program. And but all it's going to do once it gets built the Rust build program is run this xcop py setup thing where it's going to ask us. It's asking us right now. What do you want to do? Do you want to be a library contributor or a compiler contributor, um, a code gen contributor, where it's the same thing as a compiler contributor, except you also might want to modify LLVM, a tools contributor, or a uh, normal user who's just trying to install Rust from source? We're going to choose option B. Um, and it's saying, OK, it tells us it's going to use the defaults at Rust source, source, bootstrap, defaults, config, compiler, toml. And that the Rust stage, it's going to, it's it's being conservative here. It's assuming a stage one tool chain is always already linked, so it's not going to try to link our stage one tool chain uh, because I happen to, but if you, I already happen to have one named stage one in my listing or one that matched that pattern. You probably won't have that situation, so it'll probably work okay for you. Um, and then ask if you want to install a Git hook to run tidy. I'm not going to do that. Okay. The thing I want to point out here. If I the things haven't changed, this might change in the future. But for right now, running XPY setup, it's currently emitting the config.toml file that it creates into the source tree. In particular, if I now do ls on Rust src, it now has 17 entries inside of it, not 16. And the new one is this file right here. But that file does not have to stay there. You could just leave it there. And what would happen is the settings would all get inherited by any any build that you do in a, any directory that points into this one. Would If you don't have another config.toml, it would use this one as the default settings. But since I'm trying to demonstrate different config.tomls or, di or different settings in different directories and the effect of that, I'm going to deliberately uh, move that config.toml that was generated into this directory here. So now there's, we've gone back to having 16 files in Rust SRC. And now we have our config.toml in this directory right here. Okay. And if we look at it, it's actually pretty simple. It's just <laughs> effectively two lines. The first line says we're using the compiler profile, and the second line says change log C equals two. What does this mean? So um, I'll explain, I'll go backwards. So change log C equals two is an artifact of. Um, you, you can get you can you can see explanations of all the stuff, all the settings you might put in a config.toml by looking at the config.toml.example file. So, uh, because this collects all the settings you might want to use and it documents each one with a comment above it, and it says what the default setting is. So, for example, it shows that the default setting for download CI LLVM is false by default, but explains why you might want to change it to true. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but I am going to point out change log scene, which is basically this way of saying it's a way of tracking um, when we make new additions to x.py and add new keys to add to this toml file that people might want to take advantage of. We bump a version number inside of x.py 
and then x.py will inspect the version for that was last that that's been stored in the config.toml file of the user, and and prompt them saying, um, "Hey, you! It looks like you used a previous version of x.py to make this toml file, and there might be newer things you should learn about." So it'll prompt you to, to learn about other stuff you might want to add to your toml file. Um, that's, that's, that's it. I'm just explaining what changelog scene does. The only other setting that's in this config.toml file is profile equals compiler. And what that basically does is inherits the settings that are in, that are documented in uh, source, uh, source bootstrap defaults. And then inside of there, there's a file, there's a bunch of files, but the, they're all config.something.toml. And so here we're getting the compiler profile. So to learn what in settings that's inheriting, we look at the compiler one. And this inherits uh, these settings. It generates compiler documentation by extracting, using Rustdoc to extract uh, the internal compiler documentation that's embedded in the comments and make web pages from it. It uh, turns on debug logging so that the Rust, the invariable Rust C log underscore log will work with your copy of Rust. And it turns on incremental compilation and it turns on um, backtraces on when internal compiler errors happen during bootstrapping. And it turns on downloading the CI, the continuous integration services copy of LLVM. This is a huge benefit for most people because we saw how long we had to wait to, to build our own copy of LLVM. So let's, let's go ahead and see what this does, what these things do um, with these settings. And um, so we have this config.toml file sitting right here. And so what we're going to do is uh, just do another build right right here, right now. So we'll say uh, time of Rust source x, and we'll say build again, just like before, except now we have this config.toml file in place, right? So I hit this now. It's again um, doing some of the similar steps to what we saw before in terms of downloading a copy of Rust format to go into the stage zero uh, build area. And now it's building the standard library for Rust. That's the first thing we do with the Bootstrap compiler is build a new copy of the standard library on the, based on the current source code. And then um, we're going to, uh, what we do there, that step that we just saw fly by, it downloaded the, the, a build copy of Rust solely to extract from it the built copy of the LLVM archive um, in terms of the, 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 sort, the, the, the code for LLVM that we'll want to link into the Rust binary. So that way we skipped that whole step, that huge long step of building LLVM. It went by in a flash because we did. We, we went to the CI service, downloaded a copy of Rust um, of the, the build tree for for that included the LLVM source, and then extracted out the LLVM source or the, not the source, the LLVM, the built LLVM object code from that. Uh, so that saved a huge amount of time for us. And now we're building uh, the the stage one Rust compiler right now. And uh, it's on file 259 of 265. So that'll hopefully be done soon. Um, and then once it finishes, we'll be able to, you know, try it out as well, the same way that we did with the other one that we built a moment ago. Um, and so the, th the biggest point I want to make here is that by running x.py setup, we saved ourselves a, a, a huge amount of time because um, in the context of this screencast, it was, you know, it took on the order of seven minutes, uh, seven minutes locally, but the user time was in the order of 300 minutes. Okay. It finished building the compiler just now. See it, it finished building the compiler and says it's copying the stage zero compiler, the, 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 com the constructed stage zero compiler and turning it into the stage one compiler. So it was the, the product of stage zero and it's being turned into the thing that is the basis for stage one. Uh, this is the terminology is a little confusing, but the important thing is that it's this, the stage one compiler is the one that we just built and what we use to evaluate the correctness of the compiler or, or you know the changes that we've made to the compiler. And now it's using that compiler to build another copy of the standard library with those changes um, so that they keep the two things in sync in terms of if there's any changes that the stage one compiler and the standard library both need to know. And now it's building their copy of Rust doc. Uh, so uh, because I didn't specify any, the, 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 the default is for it to build the compiler standard library and uh, the Rust doc tool off the, if you don't give it any other flags to, to limit the scope of what it tries to build. So 
um, once this finishes, then we'll be able to talk more. So, okay, that was that was three minutes of our time sitting here. So I cut the time in half, but in fact, it's, it's, it's much more significant than that. It didn't just cut the time in half. The user time went down to the order of 27 minutes or 28 minutes. We started with 300 minutes, remember, when we built LLVM with the other system. So uh, it's not going to just cut your time in half. It's probably going to cut your time far more drastically because the user time was cut by a factor of 10 just now. Okay. And we have ourselves another build right sitting right here. So we could, for example, um, copy that hello world that was in, that's sitting in Rust Opt 1 into here. And then we could run the Rust compiler, stage one Rust compiler on that, right? And get our own little hello world out. Um, there are some differences between these two compilers that we built. Because remember, the config.toml file made some other changes besides grabbing the copy of LLVM. Um, the other big one that I'll note from that compiler default is it also set this debug logging equals true on the file. And what that means is without that in place, so if we go back to the Rust, Rust, Rust obj one we were able to run the compiler here and build a copy of Hello World. But if we wanted to get information about what it's doing, um, so what this is going to do is gonna, it's going to pipe output to standard error uh, that based on the debug, uh, the, the, there's annotations that people can put into Rust code, the debug, info, um, warn, I can't remember all four classes, but the point is there's, there's a number of different ways you can instrument your program, but by default, we don't include the debug, the ones that are debug exclamation points in the output for Rust. We don't embed those in the binary. To, to be generated because they're they, it's a source of overhead in terms of the um, the size of the object file that's generated the size of the executable that's generated and pe most people aren't going to use this logging if it's just for internal compiler development we don't want everyone to, have to pay for the size of that code embedded in their binary so this is a long-winded way of saying that if I were to generate the debug output um, oops sorry I want to run the compiler say rusty log equals debug and I'm gonna pipe the standard output to standard, standard error to standard output and do less on it. There is some output that's generated. That's the first thing I want to note. Um, but it's only info directives that are generated. There's the info exclamation point macro. And, um, and it's pointing out here that in fact, uh, well, I'm not quite sure of this. This, this, this is like a generic message that's given about um, what is happening, but it's, it's, I think it ends up mounting the same thing in terms of the config file, where it's just pointing out you've like asked for the debug, area, the debug. I, I said rusty log equals debug in the environment variable, and it's just pointing out that like when this thing was compiled, the max st the static level was info for the maximum level, and so um, you need to do something different if you want to enable debug logging. Remember, this is the first build we did that didn't have a. There's no config that file in this directory, and. Um, and so all we get in terms of the instrumentation metadata are these info outputs, which are things that basically these were things that were we figured were important enough for debugging problems that we wanted everyone to include it in their binaries um, because we might have people use them to track down issues in um, you know out in the field. So, but it's just only in Rusty metadata it seems like that, that it makes heavy use of that because that's the kind of there's problems that can arise there that we would want people to use the info this information to help us debug a problem that they're encountering. Okay, so that's from the build that we built that didn't have any config that Tommel inside of it. Um, if we go over here and do the same thing, where we're gonna compile the hello world from this directory and turn it debug logging, now we see a totally different output because now we're getting debug output for uh, basically every Rust module, every Rust compiler module that has um, any kind of debug exclamation point macro inside of it. So you can see there's these debug lines that start with debug right here. And there's a slew of output being generated because it's coming from every single module. And there's a ton of them inside the Rust, uh, Rust source tree. We didn't really explore the Rust source tree too much, but uh, there's a lot of compiler modules in the compiler. <laughs> a lot of crates in here. 
Uh, so if we want to narrow our focus down on one particular one, we can say rust C log equals, let's say borrow check, right? We can look at the borrow checker. And now we can say, okay, and now we just see the output from rust C borrow check, okay? And this is a good segue into the next topic that I wanted to bring up, which is, okay, now that we've done this build and we've enabled debug logging, uh, maybe we'd like to actually make a change to the compiler and experiment, see what that looks like. So this debug output, to demonstrate this, this debug output includes a line from Rusty Borrow Check. This is run query mirror borrow check main. Okay, let's keep that, I just want to keep that in mind, the run query mirror borrow check main, that's right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just demonstrate making a small change to the compiler um, where I'm just going to go in and change the borrow check code. I'm going to find the place where it says that. Um, it's some debug line inside of here. Here we go. Run query mirror borrow check. Right. This is this is the line. This course. This is what's generating that line of output that we saw earlier. And so I'm just going to throw in a line that says hello from Felix in here. Right. And if we do this, and we save this file, and then we'll be, if we rebuild the compiler right now, if we rerun the compiler right now without doing anything else nothing's changed, so we see the same output we saw before, right? Our change has not been reflected into the output of, that we see. But, so if we, but if we rebuild the compiler inside of this space, which compiler is doing um, x build, right? So what this is doing is it's rebuilding the borrow check code that changed and is rebuilding the um, some other things that depend on that that have to be rebuilt because of the change to the broad check code because there's things that link in that code. The compiler built um, a lot faster this time because it didn't have to rebuild all those other modules. And the now it's still rebuilding the standard library though. And that's because we make an assumption that if the compiler changed that the standard library that's built with that compiler also has to change. And so this implies an overhead that we're going to, that, you know, you might worry about having to pay in terms of your own development cycle, where if you are making changes to the compiler, we're going to be sitting here waiting every little change we make to the compiler um, by default, we'll end up having to wait a while for these other things to build. You know, that's a, that's a minute that we just of real time. We waited there a minute and a half of user a minute and a half, minute and a half of user time it's a lot better than seven minutes. It's a heck of a lot better than 300 minutes, but it's still a fair amount of time that we had to sit here and wait. So just keep that in mind. That, that was a significant amount of time that we had to wait just now. Uh, we'll get back to that in a second. But first, I want to demonstrate, look, we made a change to the compiler, and it has been reflected in the debug output. We now see hello from Felix in the debug output that we see right here. Okay? And... Um, if we do that same experiment with our pre with our other build, where we have no config.toml file, if I were to run X build in here, um, it's um, actually like rebuilding LVM uh, quickly. That was quick. I'm laughing because I didn't actually expect that to happen. Um, uh, but it, it uh, that was quick. It didn't need to do very much work apparently. But it's this is also reusing you know, some amount of stuff that it built before. So this, you know, similarly won't actually be, like it didn't have to rebuild everything, everything, uh, but it is still doing a fair amount of work in terms of uh, what it's sitting here doing. In particular, the config.toml file for the, uh, the, the version that we, in Obj, the obj2 directory, the one with the config.toml file, it turned on incremental compilation. And so my theory is that we might see this be slower than the other one because this is the, off the an off the shelf build with no config.toml, which means it doesn't have incremental compilation turned on, which means in theory this might go more slowly than the other one. But to be honest with you, um, incremental compilation doesn't always work as well as you might hope, even for small changes like the one we just demonstrated. And so it's entirely possible that this is going to run um, in about the same amount of time as the the other one. I'm I'm honestly not sure. Um, okay, well, the amount of user time was high. So this was user time of four 
and a half minutes, uh, about five minutes of user of user time. So the amount of real time was about the same, a little over a minute, but the user time was five minutes. The other one that was making use of, use of incremental compilation had a user time of about uh, a minute and a half. So we did actually see a significantly a significantly less amount of work being done due to incremental compilation, but then the real time benefit wasn't as high on this beefy machine that I'm demonstrating this on. Okay, so having said all that, uh, the last thing I wanna cover is that this issue that I brought up about how we've had to wait in both these cases, both in the non-incremental thing that we have in here with no config.toml file and in the case where we have incremental compilation turned on in obj2, because there's this config.toml that's sitting here that has the compiler profile turned on and the compiler profile uh, is has incremental equals true turned on. Um, so that all adds up to it's being faster to build on here, but it still had to, but in both cases, both of them had to rebuild the standard library in response to the compiler changes, the compiler changing, because there was an assumption that whenever the compiler changes, that implies there might be some change that's necessary. You have to, might have to rebuild the standard library. In particular, consider if the compiler changed something about the way that it passed arguments in the Rust ABI, the application binary interface. That's the kind of thing where the object code that I generate for a program is going to uh, obey that new protocol for passing arguments, and you need to rebuild the standard library to also conform to the new protocol. There's things where you really do have to rebuild the standard library in response to the compiler changing. This this does happen, um, and so that we conservatively assume that that we need to do that when the compiler changes. Plus, if you like made an improvement and like you know added some new optimization, you'd like the standard library to be able to benefit from that new optimization. You'd like to find out whether it you know makes the standard library faster. Or you might like to know if it causes some bug, right? So if the standard library might expose some bug that you didn't know about from, from it. Um, having said that, though, in most cases, the um, rebuilding the, the standard library using the stage one compiler, which is documented in here, where it says this is the flow, where it's first going to build the standard library using the, the stage zero bootstrap compiler, and then it's going to build C using the bootstrap compiler, which this creates the stage one compiler and then it rebuilds the standard libraries in the stage one compiler. The um, rebuilding that, that stage one standard library, this last step, even though you, in principle, you need it if, in, in, in the general case where the compiler has changed in arbitrary ways, in practice, you often don't. A lot of changes you make, you don't care about um, the, the changing, you don't care about trying to rebuild the standard library in the face of changes that are made to the compiler, in the vast majority of cases, the previously built standard library is effectively the same. Um, it could be reused, or at least the changes you made to the compiler don't need to be reflected yet into the standard library. Like maybe you added an optimization, but you are, don't want to apply to the standard library yet. You'd rather keep the standard library the same and, and just focus on trying out your optimization on the code for individual test cases that you've, you've got factored out. So assuming that uh, you want to, that you don't want to rebuild the standard library, there's a little trick you can do um, that's documented here where you can use the keep stage flag to the build, to x.py. So after the first time you've built the standard library, um, you can use keep stage to say, you know what, that, that standard library that I built, um, I want to keep, keep it as in I want to remove the, I want to remove the assumption that has to be rebuilt in response to um, changes to the compiler. So let me demonstrate this concretely. I'm assuming you remember that it took us, you know, some amount of time to uh, build the compiler in response to the change that we made to the borrow checker. So we're going to change the borrow checker again right here. I said hello from Felix. Now we're going to say hello again from Felix, right? Okay, just another minor change to this debug output. But and this, and we're going to rebuild the compiler again with this change. But this time, we're going to say keep stage one. And just to remind you, this is documented on this recommended workflows, suggested workflows subpage. Um, so it is, it is documented there. And the crucial point is that I want you to observe how fast this one goes. So we still have to rebuild the borrow checker because that's the code we changed. And we then rebuild the Rust C interface. Um, and the other, and the Rusty driver, basically the other stuff we had to link in the, the changes that were made to the borrow checker. 
into those other field products. And then uh, we're, we get a warning saying you're up and it's done. Before I even finished talking, it took about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. We went from like a minute or a minute and a half to a 20 second turnaround time. That's, that's the kind of turnaround time where it actually becomes feasible to get a sort of flow going in terms of making a change, wait 20 seconds, make a change, wait 20 seconds. And this is 20 seconds notably of, or 21 seconds maybe of user time, right? This isn't just, this isn't making advantage of my overly beefy machine in terms of the parallel processing units. This is, this is effectively 21 seconds of time that you might reasonably expect them like, you know, any modern system, regardless if it only has one or two cores on it. So um, that's an important thing to note. And the only other thing I'll note here is that it, it keeps rebuilding Rust stock and you don't have to do that. You don't have to keep rebuilding Rust stock. So you can, the, if you pass an argument where you say, look, I just want to build up to the point where I use the, the stage one compiler to build the standard library, you can pass the argument library to the build command. And that will cause it to, um, um, that will cause it to not rebuild Rust stock. And so now we're doing keep stage one to preserve the standard library we built. We're rebuilding the compiler, keeping the standard library that we built, and saying let's stop as soon as we as soon as we have gotten to this, the point of trying to build the standard library. And that got us down to 14 seconds, 15 seconds. That's awesome. Okay, that really is um, a turnaround time that is far more reasonable than seven minutes or 300 minutes. Um, okay, so that's I think that's enough those pieces there along with you know the explanation that of how to uh use this rusty log business to get to augment debug statements or add new debug statements and inspect individual modules that's that's what i was doing here is i was saying i want to adjust the log statements from within the rusty project module that's enough for you to sort of get um for you to learn how to hack on the compiler yourself so i i recommend if you're interested in learning to contribute to the rust compiler Go ahead and download a copy of the Rust compiler yourself, build it, and see if you can figure out how to make these changes. Find some piece of the code that find a debug statement like this and make a change to it, and then figure out if you can observe it yourself um, in the code that you compile. Right? Confirm that you are actually able to observe the changes you made, and then try adding a debug statement somewhere else entirely to to see you know if there's anything else that's interesting you'd like to see. Like for example, I could add a debug statement here that says. Um, print out what the input body looks like, whatever that is in this, in this uh, bit of code. We can find out what happens when we try to do this and we try to build this. And I'll be honest with you, this might uh, say that you can't do this or it might say it's fine. I guess it was accepted. So I guess we must have a debug um, implementation, a form, debug format implementation for that, for that type. That's good. And so we're about to find out and hopefully in about 15 seconds um, what that did. And look, here we go. Input body is this body. And we got a ton of output from that. <laughs> this is the kind of fun you can look forward to. We'll be talking in, in other, um, you know, in other sessions about ways to inspect things like body a little bit more efficiently than trying to wade through a, a, a massive text like this. Um, we'll get to that when we get to it. All right. Thank you for listening and uh, hope to see you as a contributor. All right. Bye.